Well, welcome to the Moving Picture Studio, James Marsh. You're here with Project NIM. First of all, congratulations on the film. Did you know that it, that it had an outlet already, that HBO were going to be showing the film while you were making it? Or was no, that, that, that came um, quite very recently, in fact, that they, they, they saw the film and, and wanted to acquire it for North American rights. And that, that was a very timely endorsement, I guess, of the film itself. They saw the finished film and, and we'd, we'd been in touch a little bit, you know, in the course of making the film. Um, so that was a kind of nice uh, kind of boost to us just when we were finishing it up. The obvious first question also is, when did you become aware of this story? I mean, Nim died in, in 2000, and I certainly didn't know much about it myself. And so did you know? I was dimly it? aware of the language yeah. experiment, so in an anecdotal kind of way. Um, but it came about through a, a book that was written about Nim's life that my producer, Simon Chin, um, kind of encountered and then sent my way whilst I was shooting a film called Red Riding, which is a very different kind of proposition than a, a document about a chimpanzee. And I read it on set, you know, I was reading it at night when I finished shooting, and I, I just really you know, blasted through the book very quickly and thought this is a really interesting challenge for a filmmaker to tell the life story of an animal, you know, using some of the biographical techniques you might use for a person, but applying them to an animal. And I, I thought immediately of this Bresson movie called Oazard Balthazar, which is the story of a donkey that's, you know, that you see change hands, you see the whole life story of this donkey play out. And it's, you know, it's a Bresson movie, it's very, sort of different from Project Nim, and I'm not Bresson by any means. But it felt like a very interesting kind of challenge to try and to bring people to, you know, to, 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 through that experience of, a, of, of an animal's life and also to understand a bit more about his behavior. So it's like a behavioral biography. You really see how a chimpanzee is, I think, in our film. Right. And so there are lots of cliches about chimpanzees and how much they like us and blah, blah, blah. But this film tries to kind of really understand their behavior as it emerges in this very strange human environment that he finds himself in. The film takes a, an emotional toll on the audience as well. Um, even writing my questions, remembering the scenes from the film, I, I, I was, you know, I was choked up because of how powerful the emotive element is in this film and what you feel for Nim. How much of an emotional toll did the process of the film take on you or, or has it over time um, dissipated. Something. Well clearly when you're making a film the emotional world of the film is the first and foremost interest you have you know and and so when I was reading the book you know you you, you began to feel really sorry for his predicament and the fact that he had no he had no uh, he had no freedom he was born in captivity and you know the sort of the, the story unfolds as you know it, it he, he's part of a language experiment and we're trying to make him like us you know it's it's a very interesting experiment on that level and the sort of theme of nature and nurture is a very important part of our story. But emotionally, you know, chimpanzees have emotions, and we see that in the film. They laugh, they cry, they crave affection, uh, they can bully you. They, they have emotions that are clearly recognizable, and that's not me projecting onto them, and that's the big mistake that so many people make about primates, is that we think they're more like us than they actually are. But I think the, the, the film hopefully does show you how he feels about what's going on to him, what's being done to him at certain points. And he's often very bewildered by the fact that we are, on one hand, we're trying to make him like us and we're you know, pampering him and, and being his friend. And another, later on, when he becomes more himself, we can't handle him anymore. And that becomes his destiny in a way. He's, he's, you know, he's, he's hardwired to behave a certain way and we can't really accommodate that.